Hello and welcome to Stocks Down Under. My name is Stuart Roberts and I'm one of the co-founders of our publication. And joining me from Perth on uh, Monday, the 28th of March, 2022, is Mr. John DeVries, who's the CEO of BlackRock Mining, BKT. John, uh, good morning, your time. Good afternoon, ours. Uh, good afternoon, Stuart. It's good to, uh, good to see you and it's good to yeah. be in Perth. Yeah, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. It took you a while to get back last time you, you went to Africa. BlackRock Mining is on the cusp of greatness, uh, in, in our opinion. Uh, the Mahenge uh, graphite project in the southern part of that country, you've completed a, a pretty um, compelling uh, definitive feasibility study. You're now in the process of looking for, for um, considerable amounts of bank debt to fund that. And it's not unreasonable that uh, before, uh, before the year is out, you'll be in a position to start doing some of the early, uh, early construction work. Um, talk to us about some of the um, uh, uh, challenges you're facing at the moment as you prepare uh, Mahenge for the next big thing. Well, the bank debt really comes back to our overall business strategy. And, and the business strategy we've put in place here is uh, to try and de-risk the project. And, and in graphite, that's really about adding a lot of transparency. So we did a, a very heavy-ended DFS with the view that we wanted to be able to attract banks to the project. Um, now we've got banks interested. We, we, we're working through the uh, IFC principles and, and the equator principles to tidy that up to make sure we are completely ready for bank debt. But uh, clearly, being able to bring a bank on, um, particularly an international bank, sends a message to the equity holders that we are, we've done a lot of the work and a lot of the latent risks have been identified and managed. And critically, what it also means is the, the level of dilution that we need to go for as a construction round is significantly lower than if we're doing an all equity process. So the logic of bringing back debt on there is, is to minimise the dilution. Um, but to do that, we need to double down on the amount of work that we do. Certainly. Now, I imagine there's, there's probably one or two costs in the feasibility study that would need to be revisited, given the uh, inflation we're seeing in parts of the economy, such as the price of steel, for example. Uh, how are you, you and your team working through that? We've currently worked through a re-estimation. So this is an internal re-estimation based on the 2018 DFS. We've gone out now, we're doing a, a tender process in Tanzania. We were going out tendering scopes of work, a mining contract, concrete, those sorts of things. And that's going to allow us to calibrate the pricing much better. Uh, once we've got that, we'll talk about it publicly. Till then, it's an estimate and, and estimates uh, we know are precisely wrong. Um, <laughs> but one thing that does you know, shift the dial a little bit is working around the uh, the IFC and, and the equator principles and just making sure that we are compliant with that. Again, we've seen that if you don't get on top of that function uh, properly, it can cost you a lot of money. Maybe not in the first year of the project, but five years later, it can start to, to really cost you as you've missed something and you upset the community or you upset the government. So that's the area that's occupying a lot of our focus at the moment. Certainly. And it's an area that um, uh, investors and, and uh, mining executives haven't had to grapple much with until until recently, uh, the idea of, of, uh, of complying with IFC type principles. Um, what's what's new for you as you as you uh, navigate this relative uh, uh, new world we've moved into? Well, uh, I guess as an engineer, it's uh, the whole uh, uh, just the sheer implication of the risk of not getting it right is, is pretty, pretty staggering, as we've seen you know, Duke and Gorge and, and certainly what happened in Serbia with Rio. So um, the risk of not getting it right is probably the, the shocking point to me. Um, fortunately, we have gone down that process pretty thoroughly. So we're pretty confident that uh, our community is happy and, and welcoming. We're very confident most of the, the elements are there in place, but it is a uh, a very detailed piece of work that we need to be doing. So, and very confident once we do that, we further differentiate the project. And you need to bear in mind here that in the graphite world, China still accounts for 90% of the product supply. So if we can come out with something that meets IFC standards um, that is outside of China, that's a massive differentiator in the markets and particularly positions as well to continue to place product into Western offtake markets. Right. Now, you have a very strong competitive advantage vis-a-vis um, -vis other players in the graphite space. Uh, your friends over in Korea at POSCO uh, have, have finally qualified your product uh, over a multi-year process. So you've done the hard yards to, to, uh, to win a pretty important friend who not only is a powerful offtake partner, but owns 15% of Mahenga, which is quite an achievement as well. The qualification process is, is a pretty nuanced process. And I think that's one of the differentiators of graphite is that 
it isn't exchange traded, it is peer-to-peer -peer sales. Um, and when you have a customer that typically they need to modify their process or in a battery customer, modify the battery chemistry to reflect what the raw material going into that process is. So it's a multi-year process. Having POSCO sit there does two things for us. Firstly, it, it makes us bankable in that we have a major Western offtaker there um, and also a cornerstone investor in the company. But once we're bankable, uh, we're able to uh, extract uh, debt and, and debt means there's less dilution on the equity register. So the, the whole thing fits into a, a singular strategy of de-risking making this thing bankable so we don't have to put as much stock out there when we come to a construction round. Certainly. And um, I, I would, uh, it, it's interesting to compare your experience with that of uh, the, the company that a lot of people who know Graphite know very well is, is Syrah Resources, uh, recently raised uh, a, a considerable amount of ca equity capital to fund uh, some downstream infrastructure they want to build in the United States to sell uh, uh, anode material. You've chosen as a company to stay in very much in the concentrate end of things. Um, what, what's your uh, philosophy behind that? Look, the philosophy on that is our project is 30 to 40% of our volume and about 30% of our revenue comes from fines. So taking our eye off the 60 to 70% of our product, which is large flake, which drives the profit line, um, is effectively the tail wagging a dog. And the way I like to think about this, if you think of, of a typical um, graphite project, and you use an airline analogy, well, it's large flake of the business class seats and they drive the, the profit line. It's the economy seats that, that pay for the costs of the business. Well, what we have here is uh, a business that is 60 to 70% business class and 30 to 40% economy. Clearly, it's a very different price point to if we were an all economy airline. So uh, it just really lets us focus where we are. Our focus on Anode at the moment is to team up with people who do know that space. POSCO knows that space. Urbix knows that space. So we're happy to work with them as opposed to compete against them. And, uh, you know, just it's a much simpler process. Now, um, uh, Tanzania has been a lot in the news lately uh, in, in, for, in terms of uh, mining investors. And uh, a lot of people are just getting used to the fact that uh, uh, Tanzania is a different place than it was two years ago. Now, my personal view was that uh, it, it was always going to, to, uh, to come back. Um, under uh, John Magafuli, uh, obviously, uh, had some uh, goals for, for, um, for, for Tanzania in terms of the 16% uh, of, uh, of mining projects that would go to the Tanzanian state. Uh, he sadly passed away last year. But, but uh, uh, his, his successor, uh, Samir uh, Suluhu Hassan, has done uh, a lot of work to, to improve the, um, the visibility of Tanzania as an investment destination. What's been your experience working with the country under both Magahuli and, uh, uh, and Samir? Very, very different against uh, each one of those um, leaders. Uh, sort of Mama, Mama Samia has done an incredible job of opening up the economy and bringing in, bringing in investment. And clearly that's had a, a, a massive sugar hit for Tanzania. Uh, and you could, you, when I was there in country, you could see the place changing up, certainly weekly, almost daily, you could see things improving. Like there's been so, a big investment, for example, I think from, um, from, from BHP Billiton, is that right? Yeah. So if you think about BHP as a, a, a classic bellwether here, BHP, you know, very conservative organisation. I know that I've worked for them for four or five years. Uh, BHP has invested $100 million into the Kabanga project up in the Lakes District. So you know, a very significant um, investment from BHP, but clearly it signals um, Tanzania has come out of the coal. Um, and I like to think of Tanzania effectively as being Africa light. Um, it is Africa, but certainly we don't seem to have many of the, the issues that plague other, other jurisdictions in Africa. We're very, very stable legal regime. Never, never been a coup in the entire history of its, of its uh, independence. No. No, no, it's it's very stable, and that gets back to the founding uh, the founding president Julius Nyerere, um, and Julius Nyerere's rhetoric was always, "I am Tanzanian, I'm not from a village." Um, so in that process, he's he's knocked out a lot of those tribal rivalries by saying, "You know, we are Tanzanian, and that our objective is to make Tanzania good." Now, coming back to to BlackRock, you've still got some offtake still to negotiate uh, before uh, before this project can go live. Would that be right? Yeah, look, at the moment, we've got something like 60,000 tonnes. You'd nominally say 60,000 tonnes is under term sheet. 
So 30,000 of that's going to POSCO, and then we have two Chinese entities um, sitting there for 30. Now, they have options to go to 45. So if you want to take a, a bullish view on this, we've got 75,000 tonnes under, under a term sheet out of an 83,000 tonne project. What we are trying to do at the moment is just put a bit more of that material as we can into Western markets with the view we go one third, one third, one third. Um, and that, that makes it really bankable um, from a bank perspective. And it's also very good from a, an overall risk management perspective. So um, yeah, that's where we're working on at the moment. Well, John DeVries, well done to you and your, uh, your colleagues at BlackRock for all, the, all that you've achieved. And, uh, and, and good luck in terms of, uh, of raising the capital and, uh, and uh, delivering uh, the next big thing in Mahenge. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll just leave you with a couple of thoughts here. If you think about the lithium ion battery, um, two things. They've always got lithium and they've always got graphite. So you want a low risk entry into the EV market. Graphite is, uh, is a lot cheaper than lithium. All right. Well done.